Okay, <laughs> I guess this is it. <laughs> um, well, um, thanks to everybody for being here. Um, and it is really a pleasure to have this time in conversation with Melinda Gates. And I, I didn't hear my introduction, so I imagine it included the fact that I spent uh, about five years with the Gates Foundation. And one of the things, as I was reading this book, um, it brought back so many memories and so many um, incredible experiences during that time, those early years when we were just kind of getting started um, in some of this. And you know, it, I think the book talked not only about your evolution, but also the evolution of the foundation and how you came to some of the things that you came to uh, that ended up in this book. So maybe just starting out, say a bit about how you got to this place around the importance of talking about women and how that um, really entered into why you thought this was so critical for the work of the foundation. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, it's fabulous for me to be here with Helene, because we used to work together, as she said. And um, thanks to everybody for being here for the Humanities Festival and for this opening talk. I really appreciate you being here this morning. Um, well, and just to give a little bit of background on myself. So um, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. My dad worked in the aerospace engineer on the early Apollo missions. And I then, I started to study computer science in high school. I got hooked on computers, went to Duke to study computer science, um, and had got my computer science degree and MBA there. And then I uh, got scooped up by Microsoft unexpectedly. So I moved to Seattle. And you may have heard I met my husband at work. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't, just to say, you know, moving to Microsoft wasn't the natural choice. You were thinking about big companies like IBM at first, right? Totally. And Microsoft was this little. Little tiny yeah, company, right. yeah. No, it was like less than 1,400 employees when I started. And um, I had worked for IBM for several summers, so I was planning to go there. Um, but then I got a job offer from Microsoft that I just basically, as I said to my parents, I can't refuse this, like what they're doing to change the world. I was so excited. Um, so I met Bill at Microsoft. I retired uh, with the uh, birth of our first daughter, Jen, and we began our foundation work. And it really was on this trip that we took while we were engaged to be married. It was our first trip ever to Africa. It was the most time off Bill had ever taken. <laughs> and we went, yeah, that was kind of funny for him to even be willing to. And we, um, we went to see the animals, and the, it was incredible safari with other couples, but it was really the people that touched us. And we just kept saying, how is it that we can be in a Jeep driving down this road and you know, being taken on this nice safari, but then people are, you know, clearly there were no markets, or people would walk to an open air market, often with something on their head, and a mom with a baby next to her on, you know, on her hip or on her belly. And we just kept saying, what, why, you know, why are things stalled in these various, we were in four countries in Africa, stalled here. And, um, and we started to begin what I call this learning journey of how might a philanthropy help intervene to help get some of these countries going so that people could lift themselves up. So that's kind of, that's where I started, or we started as a foundation, and as you well know, we started first on diseases that mostly affect people uh, in these countries. But uh, I had no idea, and we can talk about this more, that I would ever, ever, ever come to do this gender work that we uh, now do in earnest now, too. Um, and even doing philanthropy wasn't automatic. Um, you both came from families who had you know, a real sense of giving back and commitment. But in the early days, it wasn't that clear that you were going to spend, or at least it wasn't that clear to Bill that this, was, <laughs> this is what uh, he should be doing. No, it was not at all clear. So Bill had always, we, had, we committed during that trip, literally when we were in Africa, we spent some time at the end of the trip um, off of a little tiny island off the coast of Tanzania, off the coast of Zanzibar. And we walked and walked and walked. We had this beach vacation at the end for about 48 hours before we flew home. 
And it was on that trip and on that beach walk that we really committed that the vast resources from Microsoft would go back to society. But as Bill said to me then, and many, many, many weekends uh, the next five years, but don't expect me to do that until I get into my like late 60s. You know, I've got this lovely career at Microsoft. Some of you may know he's in his early 60s now, but left Microsoft 11 years ago this summer. So uh, we got going earlier than we expected. And I think it really is because we started to see that some of the things that we could intervene with as a foundation with our partners, like vaccines, that as those things would scale up and you would actually get vaccines out to children, you know, the death numbers started coming down and it just seemed so urgent and important and we got so engaged, as you know, uh, in the topics that uh, it just became clear I was already working on it, but uh, and we were both working on it for sure at home. And Bill would come in, you know, to the foundation for meetings. But then it just became more of an urgent call, and he eventually decided he'd leave Microsoft early to work on the foundation. And I think that's been a fabulous choice for him and for us as a couple. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard him say many times that you know he always thought that his greatest legacy was going to be Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And then once he got into philanthropy, he realized that in fact that was what gave him much more sense of purpose and meaning, and I think that's what you both have found. Absolutely, and um, it's funny because he definitely thought back then that Microsoft was gonna be his legacy, and it, I mean, it is. I mean, he and Steve Jobs in their, I mean, it's kind of amazing that they were there at the same time, and their competition drove one another, and so he did start, you know, software and got you know, the world on its way in software. But I always had a sense that it was gonna be, philanthropy would be his legacy. And I think part of, um, I, I, not, I don't think, I know part of what I fell in love with with Bill when I early first met him um, was that he had this huge, huge heart. And what the world saw and what he was willing to show the world was his big brain through Microsoft. But for whatever reason, he was willing with me to open up his heart. And so I knew there were these tender places and that somehow if you mix that head and heart, uh, I knew he'd be an amazing philanthropist, amazing. Yeah. And he has been. Yeah, yeah. Um, so part of this, back to the book, part of this is really about your own evolution as well as you know the evolution of the foundation and then how you came to this focus on gender, women, and particularly the issue of, of um, reproductive mm -hmm. health and contraception. Um, say a little bit about both of those trends. So how you found your voice, how you made that uh, journey to get to the point of understanding how important it is as a woman um, to assert your rights and to be able to speak to, uh, use your voice to speak for, for women who don't have a voice and then how the foundation came along. Yeah, so I think, um, I, I know that part of the reason I wanted to write this book or the main reason was I was out traveling, as you well know, you know, I've been traveling for 20 years. I've been so lucky to travel on behalf of the foundation. And I, you know, I'm in different developing world countries like at least three times a year. And while I definitely take government meetings and partner meetings, super important work, but I always try to go in first before I take those big high level meetings, just as a woman in a pair of khaki pants and a t-shirt, and I go into communities and talk with the women. I talk with men and women, but eventually the men will peel away and go back to the fields. And then as the women say, then you get to have a real <laughs> conversation. And I learned so much from these women and their stories have, animated my life and have called me to action and called me and pulled me through to realize how important this gender work is, even though I didn't want to face it and thought I wasn't going to go there. Um, and so because their stories animated my life and because I see what a difference equality makes in the world, I felt I wanted to write this book to show both my journey but what they've taught me in hopes that it would animate others to say, look, equality is something that we need in the world. It changes everything inside our families and our communities and societies. And yet we still have quite a long way to go. Um, so yeah, so as Helene well knows, because we worked together early on at the foundation, um, I was pretty timid. I, timid is the word I would use at first, wouldn't you say? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. there you go. She's being very gracious. So Helene, Dr. Helene Gale is a scientist. My background is computer science, but my background is not biology. And so we took on these diseases, big diseases, because they're the biggest killer. We took on the biggest adult killers and the biggest childhood killers. HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, things I knew about this much about before we got started. And yet I had to learn all these scientific areas. And as I would be out to talk to women, and I would often be there to talk about HIV, AIDS, or to talk about vaccines, they would tell me, absolutely, vaccines save our kids' lives, we walk in the heat, we walk 10 kilometers, we bring several kids with us. But when I would stay long enough to talk to them, they were, women all over the world were outraged about the fact that those same health clinics I would be at, a health clinic that's about the size of this stage, they'd say, but what about my health? Why could I a few years ago get vaccines for my kids? I can still get vaccines today and new vaccines, but what about my birth control? Why, why can't I get it? And um, as I started to learn from them, birth control had been available years ago, but because of political pressure and things that had happened in, in the Catholic Church, the global health community had pulled back from reproductive health. And we were still, as a, globe, as a globe, getting it out in some countries, but we were not getting it out in scale. And more than 200 million women are asking us for birth control. And as a global health community in a world, we weren't providing it. And yet, if a woman can time and space the births of her pregnancies, she's healthier, her kids are healthier, the kids are better educated, the family's wealthier, it, it literally can pull a family out of the cycle of poverty if she can time and space the births of her pregnancies. But if not, she is literally, we are condemning her to a life of poverty. And so I just, I kept hearing this rallying cry from women and as I would come back and study the data, which we can get into that if we want to, but I just realized I needed to help step up and do something about that. And um, I decided to do that with many other partners and governments in 2012 and to step on the global stage to really um, gather the resources for the first time in a big, huge way for women's health. And we, um, we uh, pulled together different governments and we raised 2.6 billion on behalf of contraceptives mm -hmm. for women. Yeah. Which was, which was definitely a truly remarkable. Uh, I'll just go back to your comment about being timid. I don't know if I would say that you were timid. Mm. I, think that, <laughs> I think that you didn't um, appreciate how important your voice was mm. and why it mattered for you, being who you are, um, why it mattered for you to use your voice, and I think you know, in, in the book, you tell a lot of stories about women who really gave you the sense that you had no choice in, in some ways but, mm -hmm. to, but to use your voice. I wonder if you want to just talk about any one of the stories that, um, that really impacted you. I mean, one, one of them that I, you know, I still think about is the woman who wanted to give you her children, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or some of the girls who um, went through female genital cutting and then came back um, to their villages. I, I could go on story after story, but say, talk about yeah. some of those and, and the ones and lessons that you learned. Yeah, um, so why don't I talk about Mina? So yeah. I was in Northern India, again, I was there in a pair of khaki pants, a t-shirt, she just knew I was a woman from the West, I was there to learn and listen. She had given birth at a health, her second son, she had two sons, a little beautiful baby infant, newborn in her arms under her sari, and then an, another little two-year-old boy next to her with her husband, and I was in her, outside her, in her home talking with her, and she'd gone to the health clinic to deliver her second child, not her first one. And so I was talking with her about that experience because we know women are more likely to survive childbirth if they go into clinic, as is the, the baby. And she'd had a really, really good experience, and we'd been a bit a part of funding that with some partners to see if it could work. Uh, but she didn't know that. But anyway, so when we were talking, um, we, she'd had a great experience, this very positive conversation. She's telling me why it went so well. And then I thought I was about to leave, but I wanted to ask her, I just said, um, so tell me your hopes and your dreams for these two, two beautiful boys that you have. 
And she looked down for a long, long time. And I thought, oh gosh, what have I asked You know, that maybe is inappropriate? And finally, she looked back up into my eyes and she said, the truth is, I have no hope. I have no hope for feeding or educating these two boys. And she said, my only hope is if you take them home with you. And I just, it, it broke me. Um, because to know that a mother loves her children that much, but if she can't feed them, I mean, you know, and she can't educate them, and that she would give them to somebody else just in hopes that if they went back to the US, some, you know, they'd be better taken care of, it just shows you um, what, what situation women are in all over the world. And she's one of many who have animated my life and called me to do this work. Um, she wanted to limit the number of her children. She was hoping that after two, she wouldn't have any more so that perhaps they could get the means to feed these two. She was very clear. They have a third one. She didn't know what they were going to do. Um, so yeah, Mean is one of the people that, that uh, definitely inspires me. And I think of her often in my head. Mm -hmm. um, it, it keeps me keeps me working on these issues. Mm -hmm. You know, as I was reading the book, um, and Mina, I think, was towards the early part of the book, and you know, I get the sense as I you know, read it and think about how you've evolved and the work has evolved, as you said, those early stories kind of just wasted you. I mean, you know, and I think it is in realizing, moving from that to, to, to action, um, and in the later part of the book, it's very clear, you know, you've kind of become an activist. And while those stories still, um, you know, they really still touch, you feel like you're doing something about them in a way that, that is very different. And so, I, you know, it, it was just interesting to see that ability to start acting on that and how that, I think, shifted your own uh, sense of, you know, how you view those situations. Definitely, and that was the reason to write the book, was I want other people to know that you can do something. We can all do something. So one of the things I try and do with the book is to go from what I learned in the developing world to back to the United States, because we need equality everywhere, and it's gonna take men and women to make sure that we lift up everybody, that women have their seat at the table, because we call for different things. We make different decisions. So I, one of my trips, I was flying home. Um, I, I, maybe I'll tell another story about Anna and Sonari, a couple I stayed mm. with. But yeah, so OK. So I was out in Tanzania with our oldest daughter then, Jen, um, was 15. And she and I stayed with a Maasai couple uh, in Tanzania. They were lovely, uh, loving relationship. Both chose to enter the marriage. They had six kids by the time my Jen and I showed up, and they hosted us at their home, and we stayed overnight for several days. I learned more on that mm -hmm. trip about what a woman's life is like, and that it turned the conversation back to me then and to the US. So let me explain what I mean. So I, Jen and I uh, followed Anna and her girls around all day. We chopped firewood, we carried water for miles, we cooked in the cooking hut. We did the dishes in the dirt at night under the moon at 10 at night when the family was finished eating. And what I finally could see, and, and believe me, um, Anna's husband, Sonari, absolutely worked. He worked at a local stall he had up on a road. Um, and they were working very hard to get more means for their family. But Anna told me the story in the cooking hut one day when we were cooking, and then I confirmed it with Sonari later. She said, um, she said yeah. I asked her what life was like for her and Sonari, et cetera. And she, she thought for a long time and she said, well, I almost left him. This was after I'd been there a couple of days. And she said, I almost left him. And I said, really, why? I mean, you guys seem like you're so in love. She says, absolutely, I love him. But she said, when I moved here from the other part of the country, which was very um, beautiful and rainy and lush, she said, his land is very arid and dry, as you can see. And she said, a woman's role is to carry the water. And I knew that when I married him. But she said, with the birth of our first son, I couldn't do it anymore. She said, you know, the water, the water hole at that time, she said, was you know, almost 17 miles away. And she said, I had to make that trip on foot and carry the water. And so finally, Sonari um, comes home one day uh, from his stall, and, 
and Anna's sitting on the doorstep. Her bag is packed with their newborn son, Robert, in her arms. And Sonari says to her, what, what's going on? She said, I'm leaving you. I'm going back to my home part of the country. I can't make it here. And he said, what do you mean? And she said, well, look, you know, this is arid land. I carry, he said, I carry the water, but I can't nurse our son. I can't cook. I can't do these other things if I'm carrying water. And he said, what can I do? And she said, well, you could carry water. And you need to know that men do not carry water in the developing world. In Maasai culture, men absolutely do not carry water. But Sonari said, OK. And so he started going and carrying the water. Well, the other men in the village just teased him endlessly. They're like, You're, he's bewitched by his wife, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> And, but slowly but surely, the other men were curious enough that after a few days, they started walking with Sonari. And they all started to realize how hard this was. And eventually, they decided to ride their bikes to go get the water. And eventually, on their bikes one day, they said, wait a minute. Why don't we come together as several communities and agree that we will all build water pans near our communities? So by the time I showed up, Anna and I would go carry water from the water pan, which was not that far away. It's heavy, but it was not that far away. And what Anna taught me was this amazing amount of un, what we call unpaid labor that women do in our homes that we don't even think about. And as I was flying home from that trip and others, I kept thinking, ah, but I wish women were more equal in these countries, you know? But eventually, I had to turn the question back on myself and say, I kept thinking, oh, we're so far along in terms of equality in the United States. But as I turned the question back on myself, I had to say, wait a minute. In the United States, less than 25% of women are in Congress. Less than 5% of women are CEOs. Less than 2% of venture capital funding goes to women's startups. And as I turned this question of unpaid labor around, while we don't carry water and we don't cook in a cooking hut here, Women in the United States still do 90 minutes more of unpaid labor a day in their home than their husband does. And I thought, wow, when you think about it and you start to look at the statistics, our economies are built on the back of that unpaid labor. And if we don't look at it and address it, we keep women from doing some of the productive work they want to do. And so that unpaid labor we do in our homes is definitely some things we absolutely want to do, caring for a loved one, a child, an elderly person, somebody's homesick. But some of it is also more menial stuff, you know, doing the dishes, doing the laundry, packing the lunch boxes, shopping. And so if we don't look at that, we're asking women, particularly in many countries, in many, many countries, every country, but in the US, 47% of our workforce is women. And so we're expecting women to work in this productive work and to do 90 minutes more of work at home. And so I've started to work more. I still work very, very deeply, and I always will, with the foundation on issues for women in the developing world, on all kinds of issues in the developing world. But more and more, I'm also starting to turn my attention to the focus of what can we do to gain equality in our own country. And I do that through a separate office called Pivotal Ventures. Yeah. Um, a lot of things that that, that, that brings up, uh, just to go back to this, you know, one of the things that you kind of coined was this notion of time poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a notion that a lot of people think about, but say a bit about that and, and how people just don't realize how time is, is such a valuable resource and when it's not distributed equally, it is a source of poverty. Yeah. So. If you think about um, time, we all only have 24 hours in a day, and you got to sleep, and you got other things you want to do, and you've got work, and so you've got to divvy up the pie somehow. But women all over the world, in India, they do six hours of unpaid work at home more than their husband does, six hours every single day. And so when you take the average across the world, women do seven years more of unpaid work at home than men do seven years. So I think pretty much everybody in here can imagine what you might do with seven more years of your life. You might get a couple graduate degrees. You might take up a hobby. You might work on your fitness a little bit more. Um, and so we need to look at that time allocation and say, OK, what, let's recognize it. Let's actually say who's doing what in our home. And then let's figure out, can we do some things to reduce that? You know, like the dishwasher certainly helps versus doing dishes out under the moon in the dirt. But then what do we do predominantly to redistribute what's left over? 
And even in our own homes in the US, I would say, look at what you do and who does what? And how did you make that decision? Because so often, I point back here, we make the decision about who does what in our home kind of based on how our parents did it without sort of rethinking, okay, what are the roles in our home? Mm -hmm. And so you also, in your own life, had to come to grips with <laughs> uh, equality um, in the context of the marriage to a very powerful individual, um, some, uh, a person who had always had his own voice. Um, and did. you know, you tell some very interesting stories. The one that I like the best is about the annual letter, because I saw that in evolution. Um, but say something about how you and Bill worked that out and how you, know, you kind of came to a sense of equality in the context of your own marriage. Yeah, so Bill and I do something that not a lot of couples do, some do though, which is we work together and we raise a family together, right? So we had to work that out in both spheres. And equality is absolutely something for both of us that we both absolutely want. But I started to realize that some of that was in theory, not in practice. And um, I'll save the annual letter and let you all read that in the book, because not everybody works with their spouse. But you'll see how I worked it out in, in the work realm. Um, but it, let me give an example from home, because people might be able to relate to this just a little bit more. So um, with our first daughter, Jen, when it was time for her to go to kindergarten, Bill and I absolutely agreed the school that we wanted her to go to. Um, but it was not close to our house. And so it was time to start at kindergarten, and I said to Bill, oh my gosh, I could see the years ahead in the minivan and the driving to and from school twice a day, right? And I just said, oh, let's keep her in the neighborhood school and let's move her to the school we both agreed to that we wanted her to go to maybe at like third grade, because we wanted to have more other children and we knew we would have lots of kids going through school at some point, and we hoped to. Anyway, Bill said no, he felt quite strongly that she begin this particular school at kindergarten. And I was pretty frustrated. And I said, oh my gosh, the amount of driving. And um, Bill said, well, um, he said, what could I do to help? And I think it was literally in his next sentence, he finally said, you know, actually, he answered his own question, I could drive two mornings a week. And he was still working at Microsoft. And I said, you would drive two mornings a week? And he said, yeah, absolutely. It'll be good time in the car with our, with our daughter. Like, I'll get to talk to her and, you know. And, and for Bill, it was gonna be an hour commute because our home was here and the school was here and Microsoft was back there. So he'd go to school, pass our house, go back to Microsoft. And about three weeks into this, and I, that seemed great, good to me that, okay, he'll do two days a week. <laughs> um, and about three weeks into the school year, one of the moms sidled up to me and she said, are you seeing anything different here in the classroom? <laughs> and I said, yeah, all of a sudden there are a lot of dads dropping off. And she said, yeah. We went home and we said to our husbands, if Bill Gates can drive, by gosh, you can drive too. <laughs> <laughs> and so inadvertently by me asking and naming what I needed in my home and Bill coming up with a solution that I, was acceptable to me and was fabulous for our, our kids long term, uh, two of whom are here, um, he, we ended up role modeling in the classroom something different. So that's what I mean about thinking about what's going on in our homes, what's going on in our communities, and then what's going on in our workplace. If we ask for equality, or we look for places, even for men to look at places we don't have it, you actually start to change the dialogue and you start to realize, hey, wait a minute, maybe we've come in with some false assumptions and we need to change things. And so um, one of the things that I know when I was at CARE and we really put this focus on empowering girls and women, we got a big blowback, well, so what about the men? And one of the things that I think you have done very well is to think about what's the role of men and how does this actually work for men too. Um, maybe say a little bit about some of your experiences with that. I know you did some work with people like Gary Barker who have great programs around men engagement in gender equity. Yeah, so men absolutely uh, are part of this and need to be part of it to help bring women along, like if, you know, to make sure we lock arms and we get gender equity. And what men are finding is, as you look at, let's just take unpaid labor, if you stay on that topic, as men look at what gets done in their homes, 
They actually want to do some of it, but we don't always allow them in or make that easy or we don't think about the assumptions we've made. Like I, even I think about my assumptions going into the marriage of who would do what. They were kind of based on the way my parents had operated. But one of the things, I was just in Sweden a few months ago, and the men to me there, so, so one other thing about the United States, we are the only country that doesn't have, industrialized country that does not have paid family medical leave. Only 17%, 17% of US workers have paid family medical leave. So when you think about our society and you think about a, a partnership or a couple, both are gonna have aging parents at some point and need care, we have an aging population. And if you have children, somebody needs to care at the birth, you wanna care at the time of the birth of the child. And so with the men in Sweden, they've had paid family medical leave for a very long time. I was saying something to the men there about and asking questions recently, and they said they were outraged that the US didn't have it. They said, are you kidding? We want to take time off with the birth of a child because then we participate and we get to do all those amazing things with a kid. And, and, they, and what we know is that then moms and dads with that time bond to the child and men then are much more likely to participate over the course of the child's life because they, they benefit from it, they love having the relationship, and the child benefits. And so part of the reason to look at all of these issues is to say, you know, where do we have it right in society and where do we not? And I think we all care about men and women raising our youngsters or raising the kids in our home or participating in role modeling for them. But if we don't get some of these societal policies right, um, we're embedding kind of what we've done in the past in society today. And to me, that just doesn't make sense. A society moves forward by changing and thinking and learning and growing. Mm -hmm. And you had a lot of good examples of, of that. Uh, we often go into cultures, and particularly cultures that are male dominated and that have, that, um, have kept women behind and think, well, this is the way it is, and there's no way that you can um, really change that, or it's really difficult. But you gave a lot of great examples of how just basically kind of holding a mirror to people's face, how you actually can shift that. Do you want to talk about some sure. of those? So I actually did some of this work with CARE in yeah. Malawi. Um, CARE had been working in Malawi for many, many, many years, like more than, I think, 30 years. Yeah. And so I go in with a partner. They're the experts. But what they did was they, sh they took me in for an exercise that they did with these women in a village. So they were introducing it in a new village. We were all sitting together with the women from the village. The men were out working in the fields. And they had this set of cards. And one color, I think it was pink, were, so it was a set of cards that were pink and yellow. And they were all blank on one side. But when you flip them over, on each of them was a pictorial um, of something that is done in the home or on the farm. So mending this, the roof, or uh, carrying wood, or cooking, or caring for the kids, or tending the field. So when they turned the cards over, they asked the women in the village to sort them by who does which task. And so there are about maybe three dozen cards, and the women started sorting the cards with these pictorials, and, and they said, sort them into the stuff that you and your daughters do, and then sort them in, the other pile into the things that the men and the boys do. And as the women started, women started to sort these three dozen cards, I thought we were gonna incite a riot, because all of a sudden they saw how many were on their side, you know, like about 30, and then they saw about six that were on the men's side. And the more the women talked, the more animated they got, and they started saying, well, what does he do when he's done at the field? And one would say, well, uh, he goes and you know, does this with his earnings, and go gets a beer before he comes home. And so the women were getting more and more and more agitated, and I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> but what they were able to actually see for the first time is what we call recognize, recognize the unpaid work. And the next step that CARE does with, is with the men then. They have the men do the same exercise, and all of a sudden the men start to see what they do and what their assumptions are. Then they bring the village together for a discussion, men and women, and they talk about they're only 24 hours in the day, think about your time. And the group starts to have dialogue about how might we change this? Why might we change it? Do we want to? How might we do that? And as men start to commit to it, and other men see uh, other men doing it, it changes the social norm. And they start to see the benefits. Mm -hmm. Like they start to see that, okay, not only is the roof mended on the house and when it rains, but hey, the yard is cleaner and the man is helping carry wood or helping carry water so the woman's having more time 
to do other things. And the men will talk about being happier in their yeah. marriages. There's right. less conflict when they're helping their wives. And I have not met, there's a man in Senegal who said to me, um, I said, why are you pulling water like out of the well? Like, why would you do that? He said, well, first of all, it's really hard. It should be man's work. He said, I'm stronger. And then I said, okay, but why else do you do it? He goes, because my wife's happier and the whole house is happier. <laughs> And I thought, yeah, that kind of reminds me. Happy wife, happy, happy life. life. You know, we say that in the US. <laughs> uh, but you start to see that there's benefits for the entire family. But it's that kind of holding up the mirror to ourselves and saying, who does what is the work that we, we need to do and to look at. You know, you have this incredible ability to talk to people and, and win their trust. And I can think about, you know, trips that we took, um, you know, when you're sitting out on grass uh, uh, in your jeans with women who kind of know that you're somebody important but don't really get the significance. And, you know, your ability to talk to women and men and have them trust you and they tell you their stories is really remarkable. And I, I think, you know, as a, as a result of that, you have really um, gotten some incredible learnings. Mm -hmm. Um, what can you tell people about why that has mattered so much? I mean, you came into this work, um, you had some ideas about what you wanted to do, but what have those stories done? And what is that, why is it so important to be able to hear those stories like that? Because what I've come to learn is that those stories are the stories of people's lives. And so, so often we look for data, and we absolutely need to have data to know that, you know, if you put a dollar down on something, or $100, or $1,000, that it's worth replicating, that it'll happen again. And we are definitely, as somebody who came and visited the foundation said, gearheads, <laughs> where we, we are trying to measure everything we do, because then we're going and calling on governments to put taxpayer dollars down on scaling things. Because all philanthropy can do is be this catalytic wedge. We can try things where you wouldn't want your government to try it with taxpayer money. But when we can try something and it succeeds and we can measure that, then you go call on government to scale up. Because philanthropy is just this catalytic wedge. But so where we were trying to do more and more uh, quantitative work, which is super important, I started to realize that these stories, this qualitative piece, is fundamental. It's like, it's in a certain way, it's the data with the soul. And it's only in hearing these stories. Like, so often we think of data as being objective, but what I've come to learn is that data is sexist. We actually haven't collected that much data about women in the developing world over the course of their lives. And so we were making decisions assuming, like if we came out with a new seed that was drought resistant and worked maybe in Kenya or Tanzania, and we assumed, and, and farmers in Kenya and Tanzania are 50% male, 50% female, if we assumed that seed would go through the seed system and get out to all farmers equally, that was a completely false assumption because women aren't served by that seed system. So we had to do special things to get seeds out to women. But, you know, so often the data doesn't exist about women. I mean, when I got involved in this contraceptive work and we were trying to decide with the UK government what our goal was gonna be of how many of the 200 plus million women we could re reach with contraceptives, we were, I, I looked at the data and it was so thin. We were making decisions off of so few data points. And in truth, you know, I would hear from women all over the world that they wanted contraceptives. And when I first look at the data, it said on, on contraceptives it was stocked in. But it wasn't until I dug down into the data and realized that what was stocked in was condoms because of the HIV AIDS epidemic. But women would tell me over and over again, I'd say, well, you know, can you go to the clinic and get a condom? And they'd say, I can't. I can't negotiate a condom in my relationship. I'm either suggesting he's been unfaithful or I'm suggesting I've been unfaithful and one of us has AIDS. And so because we weren't even collecting the data to know what other contraceptives were and weren't available, the tools that women want to use just were not there. And so we've had to actually go build whole data systems. Um, but it's those, if I had not heard those stories, if I'd just come back and looked at the data, I would have thought, well, we're doing pretty well on contraceptives. I don't know why they're not using them. Well, we had to understand the women's lives to understand 
why that was a non-starter for them. And hey, we need to apply these other tools. And we started to look at country by country and realize that women use different contraceptive tools based on where they are in their life cycle. And so unless you have a basket of tools available, different types of contraceptives, women won't be able to take them up and use them consistently throughout their reproductive years. So those were lessons we learned, and I learned from speaking with women. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at the clock and realize our time is, is getting short. So let me, a few things, and I wanted to leave you a couple minutes just to say what you think this audience can do. But um, you know, in addition to listening to stories and hearing it so that you're doing the work better, you know, I imagine it has also changed you. And I imagine writing the book has also changed you. Um, how are you different now, having finished this book, reflecting on all of these things? And what might you do differently as a result of it? Or what might you do more of? You know, it's funny because when you write a book, I didn't realize this till I was finished, it feels so good to have everything that's been rattling around your head that you think people know about you or your work. It's so good to have it in one place. And I have to say, the contraceptive work and then getting further and further into the gender work has just made me far more bold than I ever expected to be. And then when you write a book and you feel incredibly <laughs> vulnerable, because I have put some things in about my family life or our marriage, you realize um, I am who I am. And I'm kind of like, take it or leave it. You know, I've, I've learned these things from women around the world. And the whole reason to do a book, you know, even to put myself out there in my journey, is to try and help other men and women see it is possible. It's possible for us to get gender equality. It's possible for us to be full human beings. And I think so often in our country, at least today, we label people and we put people kind of in one bucket or another, or, and yet we're full human beings. Just like these women and men I've met in the developing world, we have full, rich lives. But if we care about other people, if we care about our neighbor, you care about the kids in your school community, you care about somebody who lives on the, in another part of the world, um, I would say you know, take some action. Because one of the things I most learned, I went to a Catholic all-girls high school in Dallas, Texas. I got lucky they brought computers in early before there were many computers. But the thing I mostly learned from that Catholic all-girls school, because they sent us out to work in the community. I worked in a local hospital, the Dallas County Courthouse. I worked in a public school just down the road from my school. And the nuns taught us that one person, one person mm -hmm. can make a difference in somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. And if we are here on this planet, I think we could all uh, do something to change the world. And I think we should. Other ways in which you can change the world. One of the things that you are have done and are doing, raising three incredible children. Um, and one of the questions from an audience was really about how um, you have tried to, given your children, our children of extreme privilege, how have you tried to give them um, other exposures to make them connected to the kinds of things you're connected to. You mentioned the trips as an example. So you know, just say a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, ever since the kids have been little, we've gone out in the community. I've tried to show them kind of what's in our own backyard. Um, and they've been unbelievably lucky to travel uh, with us at early ages to Africa and then ongoing. And I think it's animated for them, also their lives, to say, wow, if we grow up, we are, first of all, we are lucky. We are privileged as a family to have these resources from Microsoft, absolutely. But what I would also say, and what I think our kids understand is, we are lucky to live in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you fly off to a place like, you know, Nairobi, and you're out working in the slums, and then you come back to here, you go, wow, are we lucky to live in Seattle or Chicago, to have the infrastructure that we have in our country. Um, so I think that's been a huge part. But also, when you have your kids out, they ask questions, and you learn through them and what animates them. I remember the very first time I took um, our oldest daughter, Jen, and our son, Rory, actually, to Africa. Um, I, we were in a township uh, in South Africa. and. I was all about trying to figure out, like, where's the water, and what do people do when there's no electricity, and this and that. 
And our kids' jaws were just dropping. And I tried to take them in in very uh, age-appropriate ways. But I remember them saying, oh my gosh, look at the soccer field. Because they saw the kids <laughs> playing soccer. But the field was completely mud. There were bushel baskets set up kind of as the goals. And that was all fine. But what I hadn't seen that they saw was that the soccer field, the mud field, was on the edge of the garbage dump. Mm. And that mm. those kids were growing up living on the edge of a garbage dump. And I just, it just, I took in this sadness that I just didn't even see. And when you think about what that says to a young child, um, you mm. realize, wow. And so I think those, there are, I could tell you so many stories of what I've learned from my kids being in the developing world and seeing it through their lens and their eyes. But I think it's also animated their lives that they have talents that they're developing that they will eventually give back mm -hmm. to the world. And that makes me very proud as a mom. Yeah, that's great. Um, I could go on, but uh, that little time clock says that <laughs> time is up. Uh, first, just again, want to thank you not only for being here and um, sharing your time with us, but for all you have done and continue to do. Um, you're just a real inspiration and a role model. It's great. Uh, the book, Moment of Lift, it's out. <laughs> um, I hope people will get a chance to read it. Thanks to Fifth Third for sponsoring this. This has been a wonderful session. Thanks to all of you for coming out. And um, yeah. yeah, to be continued. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone.